You're listening to the Hillside Pulpit, a ministry of Hillside Baptist Church. This is Pastor Chad Henley, and I want to thank you for allowing the Hillside Pulpit to be part of your spiritual journey. If this podcast has blessed you in any way, would you consider leaving a five-star review on your podcasting app? That will help us get the word out to others. And we invite you to join us to worship the King at the Hill. Continue through the book of Acts, and uh, we're going to be talking about gospel defense. Gospel defense. Now let me pray for us one more time, and then we'll get started. Father in heaven, King Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, we gather again today in the fear of you, uh, just acknowledging that we're here because of you, Lord. We don't exist. We don't exist for ourselves, Lord, and we don't. We just. We don't get to just make up life or just or what it's about, Lord, but. We're here because you wanted us to be here, because you have given us life and breath and everything. And so, Lord, we're here today, Lord, because we want to render back to you, God, the praise and the glory and the honor that you deserve for creating us, for loving us, for forgiving us, for adopting us, for transforming us, for giving us a hope and a future that no circumstance in this life can take away. So we praise and adore you this morning as your people, as Hillside Baptist Church. Father, I want to pray a special prayer for VBS in these upcoming days. Father, I pray that your spirit, God, would saturate this place. Father, I pray that little ones, Lord, would come to saving knowledge of you, that even at a young age, Lord, they would understand, Lord, how their sin separates them from you, that they would see how vast your love is for them and giving your son to bring us back together with you. And God, I pray that we would see uh, young souls transformed and young men and women, uh, another generation raised up, God, to love and fear you and to shine as lights, Lord, in this increasingly dark world. So we just surrender this, this day, this week, this time to you, and Lord, just ask you to have your way. Have your way in our hearts this morning. Whatever we need to hear, Lord, speak, for your servants are listening. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Um, you know, what's interesting as we think about Christianity is that uh, Christianity uh, is an ancient religion, um, we have a 2,000-year history as the, the church, and, and really as the uh, much older than that when you consider the fact that Christianity, as Jesus and the apostles taught, is the, the fulfillment of what Judaism was intended to be. And so our roots go back all the way uh, through, um, through time, back to Abraham even, and, and even back to Adam and Eve. And so when we become a Christian, we become followers of Jesus Christ, and we start a, a new chapter in our lives when we become Christian. But even more than that, we become part of the 2,000-year story of, uh, of those who shared our faith before us. Um, and one of the challenges that we've been talking about a lot in the book of Acts that the church has always faced is opposition and, un, is, and unbelief. The Lord Jesus faced it, as did the apostle Paul. And one of the most repeated reminders in the Bible is the fact uh, that followers of Jesus will face opposition. And in fact, the apostle Peter, uh, who, if you remember, church tradition says that Peter was eventually crucified upside down for the sake of the name of Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter wrote this. He said, In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And so we as Christians always need to be ready to give an answer, a defense for the hope that is within us, with gentleness and with kindness, but with holiness, so that when people slander us because of what we believe, which happens and does happen and has always happened, right? And that at the end, they will uh, be put to shame because of our good conduct in Christ. And so we, this pas- that passage from Peter really encapsulates what's happening to the Apostle Paul here now 
uh, in, in, in this, what's happening to him in Jerusalem, right? He is, uh, we talked about last time as he is, was attacked by a mob, right? And he attempted to make a defense to his Jewish brothers, okay, in a speech there. Um, but at the end of that speech, as we talked about last time, uh, when he talks about God sending him to the Gentiles, they fly into a rage and, 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 and the Romans have to carry him off to save his life. And so how does Paul navigate this situation, right? This, this very tense situation of defending uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. What lessons can we learn today when we play gospel defense? That's what I want to talk about today from Acts chapter 22, beginning in verse 22. If you're able and willing, let me invite you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. Acts 22, beginning in verse 22. It says, Up to this word they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought to the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched, out, when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? He said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. And Paul said, but I'm a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, Yet, and yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me, in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. All right. So how do we play gospel defense? Number one, political common grace. Number two, honest Christian sincerity. Number three, clear gospel witness. And number four, sovereign divine encouragement. Sovereign divine encouragement. And I, I know you probably can't see that, but um, it's all in the note sheet in the bulletin as well. All right, so number one, we're talking about political common grace. So let's reorient ourselves to what's going on, right? Paul is removed from the crowd by the Romans, all right? They're about to tear him to pieces. Paul has been on his way to Jerusalem, you remember, for for months, okay, knowing well what awaited him there, and it has finally happened. The, the, what they said, what the Spirit said was going to happen has happened. He has been... Uh, he, he has been mobbed, he's been arrested, he's been imprisoned, okay? We know that Jerusalem at this time, as we said before, is kind of a hotbed of Jewish nationalism. And so anything perceived to be anti-Jewish or pro-Roman was going to be met with violence. And that's exactly what happened to Paul. The second, at the end of his speech, like we talked about last time, that he mentions that God had sent him to non-Jewish people, they just lose their minds, okay? Uh, they saw him as a traitor to their people and to their tribe. So they... Uh, start trying to kill him, and, and the Romans take him uh, back to the barracks, and he intends to flog him 
for information. All right, so Roman flogging was sadly a common way to extract information from people, especially those in the lower classes of society. They were going to flog him with, you've pro- I'm sure you've probably heard of the, the, the cat of nine tails, as it's called. It's what Jesus was flogged with. All right, thin strips of leather attached to a wooden handle with bone or metal attached to the, to the, at the ends. Uh, not, people not uncommonly died from flogging. But Paul, as he's being stretched out for these whips, uh, you know, they'd stretch him out and tie, tie him up, okay? Uh, he says, hey, is it, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? And at that question, the soldiers become afraid, all right? And the tribune himself asks him, are you a citizen? Yes, sir. Well, I, I bought this citizenship for a large sum, and, and Paul's like, well, I was born a citizen, all right? So to understand what's going on, we've got to understand a little bit about the Roman society at that time. Roman society was a highly stratis- stratified culture, all right? And so, and, and, you know, and depending on where you fell within society, you had different, you know, privileges and, and, and rights and things like that, all right? If you were a Roman citizen, you had certain protections under the Roman government, but Rome was a vast empire, and relatively few people at that time actually possessed Roman citizenship. Now, Claudius Lysias, the tribune, said that he purchased the citizenship for a large sum, which technically he wasn't supposed to be able to do. What he did was he, he bribed a, an official to get, his, uh, to, to get his citizenship, all right? And it cost him a good, good bit of money. But of course, that was, wasn't really supposed to happen. It was kind of frowned upon. But he asked Paul, how did he become a citizen? And Paul's like, well, I'm a citizen by birth. So obviously that was, that was a much more natural and much more noble way to obtain your citizenship. And, what, and the reason the tribune asked that is because he's trying to figure out where Paul falls in line in Roman stratification. Because it was, big, it was a big no-no and highly frowned upon to mistreat somebody who is, a high, who is higher in society than you, okay? And when the tribune realizes that Paul was a citizen by birth, he, gets, he, he literally says he was afraid because he has already mistreated this man who's a, in a higher status than him. He's mistreated him, he's, he's, he's had him arrested, and he was literally about to have him flogged, all right? And so he could get in big trouble with the Roman higher-ups, okay? And so he, he stops everything in its tracks, all right, and, and asks Paul and tries, to, and tries to figure out what's going on, right? So Paul, Paul, uh, Paul leans into his Roman citizenship, right, to avoid being flogged, all right? So Paul wasn't, wasn't trying to be a show-off, you know, and he wasn't trying to, like, uh, just abuse his social privileges, but at the same time, right, he, it, there's no virtue in being flogged just for being flogged, especially when it can kill you, all right? So he, what is he doing? So he is, he is using the social, societal uh, privileges and governmental rights that he has as a Roman citizen to keep himself from being mistreated, all right? And so there's a little principle there that I think is worth looking at as we're talking about here, playing gospel defense. And that is that uh, it is right and good, as Paul did here, to use, utilize political common grace for the good of the Christian movement and for the good of society, right? Uh, We have to remember as followers of Jesus and as citizens of the United States, right, that regardless of how broken our government seems to be at time, the truth is, is it could be way worse, and it's because we live in a democratic republic, praise God, that we actually have the ability to, to influence the direction that our government takes, right? And I just think it's good to think about that sometimes and reflect on that, right? Because if you think about it, uh, and sadly, right, most people don't like history. Most people don't read history books. But the problem is, is that when you don't understand and read history, you're doomed to repeat it, Okay. So I'll encourage you, you know, just read a history book sometime and just understand that like what the privilege that we experience as as citizens of a democratic republic are relatively recent in human history. Most people in most times and most places in the history of the world had no say in what kind of government they were under. You just lived in it and you just had to deal with it. And whoever had power, guess what? They could do whatever they wanted to do and you could do nothing about it. You just had to survive. All right, we actually live in a time and live in a place in history where we actually have certain rights within society and we can actually speak to government and we can actually help to build a better or worse society or government based on how we participate in our civic government or civic processes. And because of that, because we have that privilege that most people haven't had, we should do what? We should make our voices known in the public square 
we should advocate for just laws, we should vote for the best politicians that we can, and we should seek to use political processes to build a better society, right? Now, people get nervous when pastors talk about politics and stuff, and a lot of people accuse Christians of just, oh, a lot of, a lot of people uh, out there in society, especially the, you know, the kind of the elites out there, the anti-Christian elites, right? They, anytime a Christian talks about politics, they say, they say, see, I told you, look, they're just using religion as a cover-up to seize political power. But I just say, no, I mean, you can believe whatever you want about Christians and their motives. But the truth is, is that they don't like that because they want political power. And second of all, government and politics matter because bad government leads to bad results for people. Politics matters because people matter. Okay? And so we can't, just, we can't just keep our hands off because bad policies actually has bad effects. All right? We have to look at the history of our, our country and say, okay, look, we, we, some people think that America became the freest, most prosperous country in the world by accident, as if, the, as if the, the founding principles on which it was built had nothing to do with the way that we become. I mean, yes, our country has lots of problems. I, I 100% grant that. Some people think we're a Christian nation. We're not a Christian nation. We're as lost as the day is long. If... if if, 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 if the United States is in the book of Revelation, we're Babylon, y'all. And we're headed for a disastrous end. But what I'm, but what I'm saying is that, but, but insofar as we can, we need to try to pour into our society, pour into the country, participate while we still can in the political processes, because we might not always have that right, to try to build a country that actually works for the good of the people. And that's what, that's what Paul, and that's what Paul is doing. He's utilizing what he can in the way that he can to, do, to, to uh, uh, advance the Christian movement. And so that number one, as we think about gospel defense, is political common grace. Number two, the second toolkit that we have is honest Christian sincerity. Honest Christian sincerity. So in our story, right, Paul is, he's about to be flogged, okay, and uh, he, he, they find out he's a citizen and all this stuff. And so they decide to, thank goodness, a little more humane way to figure out what's going on. And so uh, the Claudius, the tribune, calls the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, to come and bring charges against Paul so that he can try to figure out what's going on. All right? And what's interesting there is that when Paul comes before the council, right, the first thing Paul's, because again, right, so remember that speech that we talked about last week. All right, Paul said that, he, it says that he, he, he spoke that in, in Hebrew or Aramaic, right? Which the tribute probably didn't speak. So he still probably doesn't know what's going on, okay? So he, he, gets, he gets before the council, all right? And the first thing Paul says is he says, brothers, in, ver, in chapter 23, verse 1, he says, brothers, I live my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now, what's interesting is that as soon as Paul says that, the high priest orders that uh, Paul be slapped across the, across the mouth, all right? Now, the reason for that is because Paul says that he's lived his life in all good conscience before God, right? So he's saying that he's innocent, okay? So his, his claim to innocence is actually a, a condemnation of the Sanhedrin because they're claiming he's guilty. So he's basically calling them liars, all right? And the high priest doesn't like that. But that tells you what kind of high priest guy that we're, that we're dealing with, right? That he just ordered this guy to be slapped across the face, all right? And then Paul calls him a whitewashed wall, because uh, he did, apparently he says it says he didn't know he was the high priest. The, the, um, there there would be changes, and it was very political at that time who the high priest was. All right. So the whitewashed wall language comes from Ezekiel chapter thirteen, where Ezekiel condemns the prophets in his day, right, for making the people believe false hopes. They were giving the people, they were telling the people lies and giving them false hopes. Just like if you if you have a wall that's crumbling and it's about to fall down, and you whitewash it, you make it look good when it's really about to fall to pieces. All right, and he and Paul is calling the 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 uh, high the high priest and, and the council at that time whitewashed walls. They're 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 giving the people false hopes hopes and telling lies. All right, so uh, so regardless of other people's perception of him, though Paul's defense still stands in that he he had lived his life before God in all good conscience. You know, I mean, the truth is, is even when he was persecuting Christians, even though he was wrong, he was very sincere in what he was doing. He believed that he was doing the right thing. And now that he had met Christ, all right, and that God had sent him to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles, he wasn't betraying his people like they thought he was. He was, he was, 
He was doing the opposite. He was actually obeying God. He was just doing what God told him to do because, thank God, uh, God through Jesus Christ was extending his saving promises, not just to the Jewish people, but to all people. All right, so praise God for that. And Paul was just obeying God, all right? And so, but they didn't like that. And, 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 and we know that, that Paul, Paul wasn't, you know, he wasn't uh, turning away from his heritage, right? When Paul went and preached the gospel to, in the Jewish synagogues throughout the Roman Empire, when he, when, and whenever he preached, he always preached the gospel of Jesus from the Old Testament scriptures. Because he wasn't throwing away the past. He was saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of Judaism. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of God to the Jewish nation that are now extending to the whole world. All right, And he had a calling on his life, an irrevocable calling, to proclaim Christ to the world regardless of the cost. And so now he's falsely accused. He's under Roman arrest. All right, But despite everything that has happened to him, right, he has lived his life in honest Christian sincerity. Right? Paul... You know, unlike these pro- prosperity preachers out there, Paul didn't gain anything from, from preaching Christ. In fact, Paul's life got a lot more, a lot harder and a lot more complicated the second he started following Jesus. Okay? It, it, there was nothing in it for Paul from an earthly perspective. All right? He wasn't just doing it just to have a good time. All right? He preached Christ because he met Jesus. And he had no option but to proclaim him as the Lord of the world and, and, and Savior of all people. All right? And so he had this irrevocable calling. And so he lived a life of honest sincerity in his faith from day one. He just, he just lived like he had to live as someone who knew the truth and who had met Jesus. And so he tried to have a clear conscience at all times before God and men. And so this, I think, is probably one of the greatest ways that we defend our faith is just being honest, sincere, faithful Christians. Lives of honest Christian sincerity change the world. It's not rocket science, right? The number one thing I hear all the time, all right, you know, especially in the rural south, you know, if people don't go to church, they're like, well, I don't, you know, just the church is so full of hypocrites. I'm just like, well, you know, you could come join us, you know, but, um, but, the, but what's the point? The point is, is that there, there, there's, just, there's just enough truth to that to make it sting, though. That's the problem, right? Because how many, of us, how many of us have really known someone who claimed to be a follower of Christ in this room, but the truth is that their life did not back it up? And untold damage has been caused to the cause of Christ and to the name of Christ and to the cause of the church because of people proclaiming to know Christ, but they're not actually living like it. And so when we live lives of sincere, authentic faith, all right, then nobody can argue with that, all right? And even if the world still condemns us, then guess what? God won't. God will stand by our side. God will be with us. And so when we live lives of honest Christian sincerity, we're just the same people in public and in private, in, in, in business and in life and, and at home. Whatever we do, we're just honest, sincere, faithful Christian people. What is that? That tells the world that Jesus really does make a difference. And no one can argue with that, right? And, 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 that, and that, my friends, is a life well lived, right? You might never... A a life of honest, sincere, you know, not ostentatious, just humble Christian faith, just everyday obedience to God, right? That might never gain you a platform. That might never get you tens of thousands of followers on social media. But let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, you will receive a standing ovation from choirs of angels because you faithfully obeyed God. No one else might have been watching, but let me tell you something. God was watching. He saw every bit of it. All right, and when we and and the, and heaven will roar with applause when we get there from a life of quiet, faithful integrity of clean conscience before the Lord. See, you see, and that's that's what a lot of people miss about Christianity. You know, uh, it's, especially you know, especially when we talk about politics, people get all kind of bent out of shape about that. But the truth is, is like, look, if we're going to follow Jesus, we're always we're always going to be a step behind in, in politics because because what? Because we're not going to be willing to do the same things other people are willing to do. Because as a Christian, even if we win the election, but we lose our integrity, we've lost. You understand that, right? And so, because, but we have bigger aims, we have bigger goals, right? There, this kingdom is not, the kingdom of this world is soon passing away, y'all. So we got we to keep our eyes on the prize, right? And be faithful. Have a clean conscience before the Lord in all that we do. All right? And that is our great gospel defense. So political common grace, honest Christian sincerity. Number three here is clear gospel witness clear gospel witness, all right? So during this kind of sham deposition, all right, Paul notices that the council, 
the Sanhedrin is divided theologically. There's two groups present. There's the Pharisees and there's the Sadducees, right? So you remember that they're, they're, the, the Sadducees were kind of the, the priestly ruling class, kind of the elite, okay? And uh, they were more kind of theologically liberal, to put it that way. They only believed in the, five book, the first five books of our Old Testament, the Torah, all right? They didn't believe in, and they didn't believe in the future resurrection, Whereas the Pharisees believed what we would call the whole Old Testament, all right? They were the, the strictest adherents to the Jewish law, okay? And they, and they actually believed in the future resurrection. So what's interesting is that if you carefully read the Gospels, as much as the Pharisees are kind of presented as like Jesus's main enemies, which they were, the truth is, is that theologically, Jesus was much closer to the Pharisees than he was the Sadducees. They, and, and in fact, we know from Acts uh, that in other places in Acts, that many of the Pharisees actually later converted to Christianity because many of their beliefs were so similar to the Christian movement. Okay, and so and so the Pharisees actually again believed in the future resurrection. Now, some people view what Paul did here as a tactic to kind of like divide, divide and conquer, you know. But I just think it's I think he was more sincere than that. Honestly, I just think that he recognizes that some that some of these brothers or would be more inclined to believe the gospel, and he just, and he just states the gospel as plainly as he can. With, it is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial here. And so, and so what, what, what's Paul saying? He's saying the real crux of the matter that everybody, that everybody is missing out on because everyone's trying to make it political. Everybody's trying to make it like you're betraying our country, you're betraying our people. And Paul's like, no, you're, you're missing the point. The whole point of what I'm doing, the whole point of my life is that Jesus is alive. And if he's alive, then he's the only one to live for. He's the only one to proclaim. And, his, and that gospel is for all people, and so I'm going to tell all people about him. Right? And so that was the crux, right? The Sadducees scoffed at the resurrection, but the Pharisees, you know, they're kind of intrigued about it because it's, it's validation and vindication of what they believe, right? If Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, if, if Jesus Christ has been resurrected, then that validates what they kind of knew was already true, and that is that there'll be a future resurrection from the dead. Jesus, the Bible says, is the first fruits of the resurrection. He's the first one to, to be resurrected in a glorified body, all right? And then the rest will follow him, all right, when the day of resurrection comes. But so what's the point? The point is, is that as we live in a world that's increasingly hostile to our faith, and an increasingly non-Christian culture, okay, uh, then we have, to be, we have to take pains to be clear about the gospel. Because, and, that, and that's what Paul was doing. He was trying to get to the crux of the matter, all right? We, we have to be clear as possible because there's a lot of people out there that, that, that just, they don't understand what we're talking about, okay? And, and, and they miss the point. We got to make, look, look guys, if people reject the gospel, we at least want to make sure they know what they're rejecting not a caricature of it. And there's so many caricatures of, of Christians, so many caricatures of the gospel out there that a lot of people don't even know really what they're rejecting, all right? So we at, least want, we at least want to make the gospel clear to people so that they know it, have heard it, and understand it. So if they reject it, they at least know what they're rejecting, all right? What, what, is the cru- what is the core of Christianity? It's what Paul is saying here, that a man named Jesus of Nazareth came, lived, died, and rose from the dead. It's not, it's not, it, I'm not, I, Christian, I come up here not to tell you how you can be a better person and, and, and live a happy life. I come here to tell you that somebody who is dead is now alive. And you should surrender and trust your life to him and follow him as the risen son of God, the forgiver of sin, the savior of the world. It's not just a better way to live your life. It's the only way to live your life because it's the only way to find reconciliation with God and forgiveness of sin through faith in his son that he's given to us. It's a historical fact. Either Jesus rose from the dead or he did it. If he did it, then we're just wasting our time and all this is a sham. Or if he did, then he is worthy of our complete worship and service and wholehearted service to him for all of our days. That's what Christianity is about. Either Jesus is alive or he isn't. All right, so the question is, is, is you know, what are we going to do with that? We owe the world a clear gospel message since it's through that truth that people are saved. And so, and so, and so we, need, we need to provide a clear gospel witness to people because there's just lots of confusion. On it. But I will say this too, because we, you know, bec- I think there's massive opportunity out there today. You know, because, and we talk about, you know, the way the world's going and all that stuff. But the truth is, is that 
like there's a massive opportunity out there today because there's so much confusion. Like nobody knows anything. You know, just everything's up in the air. And we, we've swam so long in the sea of relativism. Well, you know, whatever you want to believe and whatever you want to believe that people just, people, that, but people deep down in our hearts, we know that there's a truth somewhere. They just don't know what it is. So we can tell them that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We can tell them that there's a, there is right and wrong. There is up and down. You can know the truth. All right? And I, I think people are hungrier for that more than ever, to want to know the truth, to want to, to want to have some solid ground to put their feet on and say, I know this way is that, I know this way is that. All right? So there's lots of opportunity for us if we'll provide a clear gospel witness. So political common grace, honest Christian sincerity, clear gospel witness. And finally, number four here, sovereign divine encouragement. Sovereign divine encouragement. So Paul, after he spoke about the resurrection, you know, a fight break, a fight. A fight breaks out. Don't you love when a bunch of theology nerds start fighting each other and throwing fists? That's kind of funny. Um, but they, a fight breaks out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're about to tear Paul apart. So the tribune yanks Paul from the council. And then that very night, Jesus appears. Jesus appears to Paul. And he tells him in a vision. He says, take courage. For as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. And so notice here that despite the imprisonment and the hardship that he has endured, and the fact that, you know, Paul doesn't know this yet, but, you know, he's going to be in prison for, for years at this point. Okay? D- despite all that, right, we see that this did not catch God by surprise. In fact, what we see here is that this was part of the plan because God had already told Paul that what? That he was going to proclaim the gospel for, before the Gentiles and before kings, okay? And, you know, which would namely be the, the Roman emperor himself, okay? So, so, of course, right, we know from the book of Romans that Paul for a long time had wanted to go to Rome uh, but he, he, never had, he never had the opportunity to, all right? Uh, now we learn that Paul is going to go to Rome. Or, well, I guess a little bit later we find out, but, but Paul is going to go to Rome, and he's going to have a personal escort from Roman soldiers. <laughs> Maybe not the way he wanted to get to Rome, but guess what? It was God's plan. That's how God was going to get him to Rome. And so while imprisonment might not be his first choice, he was smack dab in the middle of God's plan for him. And that's part of the Christian life. That, that may be a hard part to swallow, but it is, a, it is a wonderful part to swallow. And that is that even the detours in life, even the hardships in life, right, are just God's plan to get us to where he wanted to be. It might not be our plan to get there, but part of faith, right, is saying, God, I trust your plan to get me there better than I trust my plan to get me there. And that's part of and, and that's what God tells him to do. Paul, God, I mean, Jesus tells him to take courage, to not be afraid, right? To not be afraid. And so maybe, and so, you know, we never know when a situation like that's going to face us, or maybe we're facing one right now, where that situation, the unexpected situation just caught us off guard, and we're not sure how this fits in what God is doing. And maybe Jesus just wants to tell you, like he told Paul 2,000 years ago, to take courage, You must get to where I'm going to take you. And this is how you're going to get there. So just trust me. Just trust me. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. God is in control of the detours. Right? He's in, you know, my my plan might not work, but usually my plans aren't that good anyway. (laughs) God's plan is good. So take, so God has a way, right? God has his ways of encouraging us in the face of our trials, of reminding us that he's in control. So maybe somebody this morning just needed to hear that, that God's in control. That Just like Paul, right? Paul was in prison, and he just, you know, and, and all this crazy stuff had just happened to him, and next thing he knows, he's in Roman custody, and he, has, he, was, he barely escaped being flogged, all right? And he doesn't know what's about to happen. He doesn't know, but God does. So God told him, hey, hang on. Take courage. Don't be afraid. I'm going to get you where you need to go.
So let's take heart this morning. Let's, let's, let's be faithful as we play gospel defense using political common grace, honest Christian sincerity, clear gospel witness, and taking sovereign divine encouragement. You know, as, we, as, 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 we, as I like to talk about, you know, as I like to say, you know, I, I don't have a lot of high hopes for the world, but man, I have really high hopes for where God's taking his people. Really, really high hopes. So we don't have to be afraid because God's going to take us where he wants to go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're looking to you today, and we do take encouragement in your sovereign divine power. Lord, there's so much in this world that we're just not in control of, and it's easy to get frustrated or angry or, or scared or anxious. But Lord, you're in control, and so we're looking to you. And Lord, we knew, we knew, we know that, that this world would, uh, over and over, your word says that in this life we will have tribulation. But your word tells us to take heart because you have overcome the world. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be, as Jesus, as, as our Lord said, to be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Help us to be faithful with the opportunities and privileges and responsibilities that you've entrusted to us. But, Lord, help us keep the main thing the main thing. Help us not to get off course by focusing on things that aren't of ultimate importance. Lord, help us to play gospel defense. Lord, help us to be clear with the gospel. Lord, help us to be honest in our lives and sincere in our integrity. Lord, uh, help us to bear witness to the goodness and life-transforming power of Christ by how we love and serve and obey you. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us in that due season, in that due moment when we need it the most, Lord, that you would give us that encouragement to help us, Lord, to trust in you, to hold tight, knowing that you're going to get us where you want us to go. Our hope and our faith and our trust is in you, and Lord, and we are hopeful in what you're going to do. The, the, uh, you, Lord Jesus, will build your church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so, Lord, help us to be your church as we love you, love people, and make disciples for the sake of the name. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.